everyone who is joining this webinar. This is Andres Banet speaking from Speaker Hub, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome here Tufit, who's joining us from Canada. And today, the topic of discussion will be her presentation on stepping into the spotlight, how to stand out, get noticed, and get known. Now, we're not going to be using video even at the beginning. We decided that having a, a picture of us so you can see who the speakers are, and especially to fit uh, today's uh, speaker and presenter will be the main uh, lead on this show. So we're very happy to have you, and I see that there are a lot of participants from all over the world, from Middle East, from Europe, from uh, different parts of the U.S. And uh, a technical note, you're very welcome to type any question or just to say hi into the chat box at the bottom left of your screen, or if you're on a mobile device, it might be displayed somewhere else, but there's definitely a chat box. Share your thoughts, your feedback, your questions with us, and uh, we'll be looking at it possibly at the end of the presentation and making sure that we cover as much ground as we can. Now, Sufit is a fantastic person because uh, she was not only recently featured in Forbes, she's also the author of an award-winning book called Step Into the Spotlight, A Guide to Getting Noticed. And I'm actually reading this book. I have to confess I haven't finished it yet, but everything that I've read so far was very, very interesting and even more importantly, entertaining. So I'm very curious to hear her take on uh, this uh, topic and to share her advice of how to become a star. And Sufit is a former lawyer. She's also a, a former singer and actress who's been described by Tor the Toronto Star as a starburst of energy, bright, bubbly, and upbeat. So Sufit uh, is a, as a, also a keynote speaker and a TV show guest, and she often offers coaching and training to others on many of these topics. So without any further ado, we'll move to the next slide. And uh, we discussed at length whether or to use slides or not. And this one, we're trying the approach where we're going to be more of a conversational approach. So not many slides, but we will definitely offer the sound recording, the webinar recording, and a few days a transcript of the show. So that's something you can certainly read, but you can, of course, take notes as we cover all these grounds. So with that in mind, Sufit, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. My company specializes in the facilitation of soft skill solutions in the proactive environment. I'm the project manager. We're a one-stop shop for small to medium-sized businesses. And today, our topic is <laughs> – I'm messing with you, Andres. Don't get upset. Don't say, why did I invite her? <laughs> yes, being boring. That was coming. Being boring is a huge mistake that speakers make, and uh, I don't know how many of you believe me, but every time I speak live, there's a few people who believe that and they're shocked. <laughs> so being boring is a huge mistake, but that's not what we are going to discuss on this master class today. Why? Because you already know that. Right? Duh. Of course, being boring is a big mistake. But we're going to go beyond that. We're going to talk about the business of being a speaker and how you step into the spotlight and get known and get noticed. And we're going to do it in a very interesting way. We're not going to do it the way we usually do it with me telling you a bunch of stuff. I'm actually going to share with you the biggest mistakes that speakers make. And if we have enough time, I'm going to share 12 of them. So here's what I want you to do. Pull out a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. Don't try to do this on your computer because it's going to be way too uh, hard on a computer. Just grab a you know, low-tech <laughs> pen, a pencil, a uh, piece of paper, and put it horizontally, landscape, side to side. In the middle, I want you to put a small little box about 2 inches by 2 inches square. And in the middle of that box, I want you to write speaker mistakes. Speaker mistakes. Okay, you, you're all doing that? Yes? All right. <laughs> Somebody said I fooled. Yeah, good, good, Seth. I'm glad to hear that. So here's what we do. Um, I want you to put some spokes coming out of that box in the middle, uh, spokes like on a bicycle. And at the end of each spoke, I want you to put like a balloon or a bubble, a round circle. And in each of those circles, you're going to fill in one of the mistakes. And yes, I could have created a pretty PowerPoint for you or asked Esther. Thank you, by the way, Esther, for creating these slides. But I could have asked Esther to create a pretty little PowerPoint for you, but I chose not to. Why? 
because you will remember these mistakes way better if you write them in yourself. And I've got a ton to share with you, so let's dive right in. Every time I, make, uh, I, I tell you a mistake, I share with you a mistake that prevents speakers from stepping into the spotlight, I want you to write it in one of those circles and bubbles. Yes? Okay. Mistake number one, jumping straight into the topic of the speech without telling your story. So what I want you to write in the box is no story. That's mistake number one, no story. Jumping straight into the teach and preach speech <laughs> without telling your story. I am shocked how many professional speakers do this. They start doing the teaching and the preaching, and the, and the audience is thinking, who the heck are you? Why should I listen to you? So before we dive into the whole big long list of the biggest mistakes speakers make that prevent them from stepping into the spotlight, let me answer that question for you. Now Andres shared a little bit about me in the introduction, but I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, my story, I've been on stage since I was a little kid. I was singing for the neighborhood kids on somebody's back deck, and I always wanted to be a star like on TV, right? I grew up watching all the TV shows, and it, it was a much kinder, simpler time. Um, nobody ever voted you off the island like they did on Survivor. It was a, a nice, gentle time. And I did get an amazing education. I graduated top of my class from the 19-inch Institute of Higher Learning. 4 p.m. sharp every day, pretty rigorous program back then. In those days, you actually had to get up off the couch and walk all the way over to the TV, all the way over to the television, and turn the channels manually. I'm talking by hand to get a full, well-rounded education at this institute. Obviously, I'm joking. I'm saying I learned from television. And now I make my living from what I learned from that box, from that TV box. So forget thinking outside the box. Why would you when everything you need to know is right in there, in the box? I learned so much from the TV shows and especially from the commercials. And eventually I got shows, some commercials, nothing fancy. It wasn't a direct route to stardom. For 10 years I played the part of a lawyer. Um, I had four kids in four years. And 20 years ago I made a monumental decision. I left the law, kept the kids, and decided to follow my dream and leave law for the limelight. I left business for show business. My parents were predictably thrilled. You're leaving law to be a what? Actress? Schmactress is what my mom said. But by being in both worlds, business and show business, I discovered that all business is show business. And so now I've spent the past 14 years coaching speakers, experts, entrepreneurs, coaches, professionals to get seen, get heard, get noticed, and get known and how to step into the spotlight. So that's me. That's my story a little quicker than I would normally tell it. Make sure you include your story in your speech so that it's memorable enough for people to tell other people about you. So that's mistake number one, not including your story. Mistake number two, so I want you to write this in the second bubble. Now this one will surprise you. You'll be shocked by this one probably. Identifying yourself primarily as a speaker. right? So the big mistake that I want you to write in bubble number two is calling yourself a speaker. So what does that even mean, you call yourself a speaker? Um, everyone speaks just like everyone walks, but you don't see people walking around calling themselves walkers you know, or professional <laughs> walkers. The difference between a person in the spotlight and, and everyone else is that the person on stage has something important to say, something unique to say about a particular topic to a particular audience. So it's much smarter to get known as an expert who speaks, an expert who trains about his or her topic, right? It doesn't mean you have to have a PhD, you know, you can be an expert maybe from experience, maybe because you studied it, maybe because you researched it like Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. Maybe you're just a star in business like Steve Jobs or Mark Cuban or Seth Godin. Um, but none of these guys identify themselves primarily as speakers, right? So big, big mistake. Um, mistake number uh, – what number am I at right now? I'm at mistake number three. Number three. Number three is not knowing what to say when you only have 30 seconds in the spotlight. Okay, that is a big mistake. So um, if you have 30 seconds and you don't know what to say in those 30 seconds, um, it's not going to help you very much, right? Um, I, and, and you know, it, it's funny because I actually once saw a speaker stand up and say that she was a humorous speaker on the topic of leadership, but um, her 30 seconds wasn't humorous. 
So that didn't really get her very far, right? And I did speak, I hear her in a longer speech, and she was actually very funny, but that 30 seconds was boring. Nothing funny about it. So you really have to figure out this 30 seconds, right? It's different than a 30-minute speech or a, uh, an hour speech. If you can't say what you do in 30 seconds, you will never be able to say it in 30 minutes either because the truth is, guys, you don't even know the essence of what you do. This is, if you can't say it in 30 seconds, this is something you have to nail. It's really like a mini show. It's a compressed period of time. So that 30 seconds is so important. I've even taught a four-week course on the 30 seconds. It matters. In 30 seconds, you've got to use story. You've got to use color. You've got to use flavor, drama, humor, silence is a great attention getter, right? Once I started um, at a networking event, and when it was my turn to speak, I started by being silent and sitting, right? And then in the middle of my 30 seconds, I stood up, right? And it was a dramatic event. So, you know, if you get good at that 30 seconds, it will be easier for you to get known as a speaker and to attract speaking gigs because I've got a lot of speaking gigs just for my 30 seconds. Don't say your name at the beginning of your 30 seconds. Um, don't say, hi, I'm Joe Blow, and I'm a motivational speaker on the topic of leadership and self-development, so go check out my website. You might as well stay home if you're going to do that. Nobody's going to check your website unless you give them a compelling reason to go there. Right? Um, there are ways to get them there, and I will demonstrate that for you in real time in a second. But I've got like 100 of these little mini 30-second things, I call them infomercials, that I've written over 14 years. But when I do a 30 seconds, I don't end by telling them, you know, please go to my website. Why? That sounds needy. And, and being needy is a huge mistake, right? You don't need to sound needy. So I don't end it by saying, so if you want to buy a copy of my book, come see me afterwards. So if you want to hire me to speak, come. no, I don't do that. I say 20 bucks if I like you, 30 bucks if I don't, right? Everybody laughs in the room. And you know what they do when they approach me after the meeting? They, they approach me with their wallet in their hand, and they're, they're not sure if they should give me $20 or 30 And they always ask me the same question, do you like me? So that's um, one of the ways that you can master the 30 seconds. But if you want more on that, because I have a whole free tip series on how to master the 30 seconds, I'm going to give you a URL you can go to right now. And Andres, if you want to change to uh, page 3, there you go. If you click, I think that's clickable, the, the brown uh, thing uh, link underneath there. You, try case, clicking, well, yeah, try clicking there right now, guys. We'll, if it's we'll not quickly, clickable, we'll put the link into the chat yeah. box. Yeah. I think I tested it once and it was. But anyway, if it's not clickable, um, do it right now. So open a new browser. Um, go to that URL, spotlightsecrets.com. Um, put in your name and email. A short form will pop up. A second form, fill that in too. That's uh, a new um, law in Canada. We need a, a higher level of permission. And I will send you my 11 free Spotlight Secrets on how to nail your 30 seconds. Okay? And by the way, um, did you see how I got you to my website? Right? I mean, that's just one way of starting to build an audience. We'll talk more about that later. But I want to tell you something. I once got a 15-minute spot on national television where my book was featured, all as a result of an impromptu 30 seconds with the host of the show just before she was getting ready to speak. I was only in the audience. I wasn't the speaker. She was the big speaker. But after meeting me for just 30 seconds, she announced to the whole room that she was going to have me on her national TV show, and she did. Right? Same thing happened when I met Laura Langemeyer in The Secret. 30 second conversation and she got me on her national radio show. So it's important to learn how to do this. The free tips are at SpotlightSecrets.com. Mistake number, uh, what are we on now, Andres? Four? Number four, yeah. Four. Okay, number four is being an interchangeable commodity. Okay? No persona, no brand. It's not enough to be a speaker. Right? Do you want to be, be sent out when somebody says, I need a speaker on leadership, uh, I need a speaker on stress. No, you want them to say, I want to see. Uh, you want them to say, get me Andres, right? Um, because they've heard of you. Uh, think about it. The, you know, remember in the old days when you used to go to a, a CD store to buy a CD? You didn't go there and flip through the thousands of CDs on the rack. You usually go with, in there with a specific CD that you're planning to buy. You buy it and you walk out. Right? So do you want to be one of those thousands of CDs on the rack screaming to the customer, pick me, please, pick me, pick me. That's what speakers do. Don't be doing that. You need a persona. You need a brand. What is a brand? You have to have a look. You have to have a language. You have to have phrases that you repeat over and over. Um, uh, David Bach got on Oprah, he's a financial advisor, by using the phrase, the latte factor. So 
um, you know, or, or, or in Survivor, they talk about uh, the tribe has spoken or things like that. So it's very important that you have a signature um, phrase that you use. Mistake number five, um, and put this on your bubble on your page. I hope you're doing this. Um, having a whole menu of speaking topics. So the mistake is having a menu of speaking topics. Don't be doing that. Why? You see a speaker website, they've got a list of like 17 topics, leadership, breaking the barriers, how to deal with stress at work. You know what? You know how many topics you should have ideally if you want to get noticed and you want to get known? How many? I want you to type it in the chat box now, guys. How many, um, mis how many uh, speaking topics should you have if you really want to get known? Seth says three. Karen says three. Ulrika says one. Tom says three. Sean says two. Richard says one. Well, Ideally, I agree with Richard and Peggy Dyer. Um, one, one speaking topic, one main speaking topic. Guys, what's my main speaking topic? Type it into the chat box if you know what it is. Uh, any idea what it might be? Um, nobody knows what my main speaking topic is. My main speaking topic is, oh, a bunch of people are typing. Uh, I'm just going to give another second to see if you got it. Getting noticed, okay, Seth, yes, that's, that's close. That's, actually, that is the topic, or you could call it something else. You could say, uh, step into the spotlight. But anyway, people know that when they want to get noticed, when they want to step into the spotlight, that's what I stand for. Now, I might have two or three other little mini speeches underneath that, like I have one about the 30 seconds or how to write a book or things like that, but they're all under the subset of getting noticed, and the people who responded in the chat box knew that. Um, now some of you might be thinking, well, if I only have one topic, how will I ever get to speak to the same audience more than once? And that's a really good question. Well, the answer is you can dig down deeper, slice the onion even thinner. So your main speaking topic is your umbrella, right? But it's okay to have a few subtopics. So like I said, you know, my main topic is step into the spotlight, getting noticed, but I have some subtopics about the 30 seconds or writing a book or, or things like that. So that's um, mistake number five. Mistake number six is not understanding the concept of BYOF, which stands for Bring Your Own Fans. So when I was a singer, Bring Your Own Fans, when I was a singer, I thought it was enough to just be a great singer, the way some of you think it's probably enough just to be a great speaker. And I was performing, I was singing at a, a, a little club, and um, the audience was kind of small, and the owner came up to me and said, Sufit, bring your own fans. Um, and I learned a lesson that day. She didn't want me because I was a good singer. She wanted me because I was bringing people in the door, right? So when I spoke recently for uh, an international coaching organization, um, a virtual chapter out of Los Angeles, they said it was the highest registration rate they'd had in recent memory and the highest turnout rate. Um, it wasn't just because of them. It was because I promoted it and I brought some of my own fans. Don't always rely on the person who hired you to speak to fill the room. So how can you do this? There's two ways, and these are not new mistakes, but these are sub under that mistake of not bringing your own fans. There's two things you've got to do. Number one, you've got to learn how to be your own publicist. So unless it's a private in-house corporate function, you need to publicize the event as well. So Andres publicized today, but I also sent out tweets about it and, and LinkedIn updates and all sorts of Facebook things about it because I want people to show up. I want it to be successful for Andres. I want him to be happy that people came and he, I want him to get fan mail from you guys afterwards saying you loved it because it helps me and it helps him. So you have to be your own publicist, number one. That will help you substantially increase your speaking fee because if they know know that when you show up, people show up, your speaking fee will increase. Number two, it's very important to build a permission-based email list. Right Now you can build other online communities. I've got a Step Into the Spotlight group on LinkedIn. But the most important thing I have, the most important asset I have is a permission-based email list. And I've already modeled to you how I build it. Right When I invited you to go to SpotlightSecrets.com, again Andres, if you want to put that up for a second, uh, slide three. Um, when I invited you to go to www.spotlightsecrets.com and put your name and email in there, now I, you know, what do I give in, in exchange for that? I give these free tips about how to stand out for 30 seconds. What do I get for that? I get people on my list who are interested in what I say. So if I released a new book tomorrow, which I'm not going to do, I would have a list of people to send that to. Or if I'm speaking somewhere tomorrow, I would have a list of people to send that information to. And by the way, for those of you who have not yet gone to Spotlight Secrets, Secrets.com. Do it now, and after you've done it, I want you to type in the chat box, did it, 
D-I-D, and then the word it, did it. So Andres will know that you did it. Um, and make sure you fill out both forms that pop up when you go to SpotlightSecrets.com because at the end of today, I'm going to ask Andres to pick three people who, who wrote did it and who did uh, uh, opt-in. Um, and I'm going to send you a free two-part audio called 17 Secrets of Stardom, which you will absolutely love and because it will give us more time than we have today. Three of you are going to get that. We're going to randomly pick three of you um, who have um, – logged into SpotlightSecrets.com. So why is this so important for you to do it next time you speak? Because it helps you step into the spotlight. Because when your speech is over, guys, all you've got is the audience that you've built, right? Maybe a video or an audio if you taped it, but basically all you've got is that audience. And the Beatles once said, you know, let's write ourselves a swimming pool. What they meant is let's write a song. They knew they had a big fan base and they could get it out to that hungry fan base. Now I don't know how they did that without email, um, but now it's a lot easier, right? Um, without this, your own permission-based email list, you will always be chasing the next gig. You want better people should chase you um, rather than you chase them. Okay, mistake number seven. Moving on, requesting too low a speaking fee. So low speaking fee. Uh, a member of my Step Into the Spotlight group on LinkedIn um, told us a story of how he lost a speaking gig. Uh, or maybe it was a training gig, because he asked for too low a fee. He almost had the deal, and he thought he was doing them a favor by lowering the fee. The guy later told him, the guy in charge later told him that that's why he lost it, because it undermined their confidence in him as a speaker. Do not make that mistake. right? I have to assume that all you guys listening right now are great speakers, great at what you do. So don't be sending mixed messages to people by offering to speak for peanuts. Right? People are buying confidence, and your fee is part of how you um, communicate that confidence. Like You wouldn't expect to go in your local Walmart or whatever store, I don't know what you have in Europe uh, or, in, or in the Middle East, but your local you know, cheaper store, you wouldn't expect to go in there and find a Rolex for $20. Right? Um, if somebody approaches me and wants me to speak and the fee is too low, I tell them to save me for when they're holding a bigger event with a bigger budget or maybe they can attract a sponsor. Um, often they'll come back and just do that. So that's mistake number seven. Mistake number eight, not being narrow or focused enough. Not being focused enough. Go narrow or go home. What do you want to be? Do you want to be an MD, a physician fixing broken arms and sore throats, or do you want to be a thoracic heart surgeon who gets paid much more? Which one is much more of a star, right? Um, you know, who, who do you wait longer to see? If you call yourself a speaker on leadership, you might as well stay home and eat Twinkies, right? Because if, you're, if your topic is stress management, stay home and watch TV. You need to slice that onion thinner and thinner and thinner until you own the topic, until people know what you stand for. So I asked you before, what's my topic? And you all typed into the chat box, getting noticed, right? Or step into the spotlight. Well, one of my clients is a lawyer. When I met him, he'd been in practice for over 30 years doing litigation and real estate and wills and estate litigation. And I told him, buddy, drop all that stuff. Drop the wills. Drop the real estate and only focus on one of these things. We, he ended up choosing estate litigation. But that's still pretty broad. So we focused it even more so that he f focuses on estate disputes between adult siblings like brothers and sisters. And now we've been able to almost double his fee, not quite but almost. His retainer is 10 times what it was when we started and he's getting lots of media attention. He's being asked to speak. His colleagues are shaking their heads. They keep asking him, you know, how are you doing this? Um, and now he's even working on a book on that topic, which by the way brings us to our next mistake, mistake number nine. Mistake number nine not creating a book with your name on it. Now, I know you guys have been told this before, and some of you are probably sick of hearing this, but books are magical marketing tools. Why? They crystallize your message in such a way that people can consume it even if you're not there. Uh, Andres just shared with us that he's in Belgium and he's partway through my book. Okay, I've never met Andres in person. There was no reason that he would ever have to read my book. If, or, 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 you know, if I didn't have a book with my name on it, he wouldn't have probably heard of me in the first place. So if you use your book strategically like seeds, they increase your visibility, your credibility, your influence, your reach, and they are the perfect way to attract media attention to your speech speaking engagements, and they're a perfect way to attract speaking engagements. Uh, Dan Pointer, late Dan Pointer, used to say that in the word authority, 
is the word author. So when your book comes out, send copies to the media, to bloggers, to influential, to people like, you know, a leader of Speaker Hub or to people who, you know, have a, a platform for you. And if you're smart, your book title will be the same as your main speech title and the same as your 10-week course title and the same as your LinkedIn group title because that way you can brand yourself in the minds of your market. So um, that's really important too. Um, mistake number 10 is relying on speaking as your sole source of income. You don't want speaking to be your sole source of income because how, oh, you know, there's only so much traveling a person can do. There's only so much um, schlepping around a person can do before you get tired of it, right? Don't you get tired of it? So um, I, I would suggest to you that you know your voice is going to give out uh, at some point. You're, uh, you might be sick. You might not feel well. You, th there's, there's a million reasons that you might want to have something on the back of your book, some kind of a business that's on the back of your book. Um, it happened to a client of mine. You know, um, She had a stroke and she could no longer speak. Another one lost her voice. And if that were your sole source of income, forget about you're done. Speaking is best used as a part of your business as a marketing tool, something big on the back end. You can make your whole income from it. Um, but if you have a few other things, if you have a program, if you have audio CD, while I'm speaking to you guys right now, there's somebody somewhere in the world who's taking my online course. There's somebody else somewhere in the world who's listening to my online, you know, to my CDs. There's, there's all sorts of stuff that's going on while I'm speaking to you. So I don't have to rely on, you know, if I show up today and my voice gives out, um, I don't have to rely on that as my sole source of income. So um, big mistake. It's best used as part of the whole thing. Mistake number 11, going out of character. Going out of character. Now I want you guys to remember all business is show business. And you cannot go out of character just because something technical goes wrong. right? By the way, one of the best times to demonstrate to your audience that you're not just another speaker is by how you react when there are technical glitches. Do you start whining? Do you say, my microphone's not working? Or do you stay in control and in command and still stay a star in the eyes of your audience? Right? I don't know if you guys over in Europe heard about Kanye West throwing down his microphone at a big concert in Toronto when his mic was acting up. Now I don't know if it's true. I wasn't there. but I. I read about it online. We've all seen performers and speakers complain when the mic's not working, when the PowerPoint's not working. Well, I went to a concert years ago. The guy singer, his name is David Broza, huge auditorium. The electricity went out. There were no lights, no amplification. Um, and it's one of the best concerts I've ever seen. So mistake number 11, going out of character. I'll give you one more example. I was singing at a nightclub, and I was sick, really sick. I had a cold. My voice didn't sound that great, right? I couldn't cancel because I was the whole show. Most singers would go up there and make excuses like, I don't usually sound like this or I've got a cold. No. I walked up and took control and made lemonade out of those lemons. I walked in with a huge wicker bag and I slowly took out a box of Kleenex, slowly and deliberately, and I set it down on a stool. And then I took out a second box of Kleenex and I set it on top of that. And then I took out a third box of Kleenex and I set it on top of that until there were five boxes, a whole tower of Kleenex stacked on the stool. Then I slowly and deliberately took out a jar of honey. Then I took out a box of cough drops. Then I took out a box of tea. I would have put a tea kettle in there if I had had room. And with each thing that I pulled out slowly, the audience started to laugh and laugh and laugh until I had them in the palm of my hand. And I've got to say, it wasn't my best vocal performance, but it didn't matter because as long as you're in command, you're a star and the audience loves you. So um, that's mistake number 11. Mistake number 12, and you know, I could go on for months with mistakes, but we're going to wrap it up with mistake number 12, is not knowing why you're there. Write that down in the bubble for mistake number 12, not knowing why you're there. Every single time you speak, you've got to ask yourself, what is my goal today? Why am I schlepping in my car? Why am I hopping on an airplane? Beyond the applause, beyond the speaker fee, beyond reaching out about something you're passionate about, you've got to ask yourself, what narrow, specific result do I want to happen? 
as a result of me speaking today. So maybe you want them to buy your book. Maybe you want to be asked to speak at another conference or, or a master class like Andres has put on today for Speaker Hub. Maybe you want to add fans to your permission-based email list like I suggested that you do um, by going to SpotlightSecrets.com. Maybe you want to be invited to appear on TV. If you don't know what your goal is, Again, you might as well stay home and eat Twinkies, right? Lots of speakers make this mistake. Um, I hope that you don't. So in a second, um, Andres is going to open it up for questions. But before we do that, two things. Um, I want to give you one last chance to go to SpotlightSecrets.com to get the free tips on how to stand out in 30 seconds. Make sure you fill both forms and then type Did It into the chat box. At the end of our question and answer, um, I'm going to ask Andres to pick three of the people who type Did It. Um, and those three people are going to get an amazing two-part audio called 17 Secrets of Stardom. Um, and, um, and now I think we're, uh, we're ready for questions, Andres, if you are. Sophie, this is incredible that I honestly didn't think that you'd be able to pull it off, that in 30 minutes you'd cover the 12 uh, tips uh, all the while uh, giving away a lot of uh, free, free ideas and insights, and you did it. So that's fantastic. And I'd like to ask everyone, please ask questions because there, so there were so many ideas flying around and uh, so many good tips that are all actionable and something we can translate into a better speaking business. Here's the first one. What is your opinion about speaking for free? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, okay, okay, here's, here's the answer. If, if, there's, if free means that there's nothing in it for you, right? If, if free means no money, you know, that, that they're not paying you money on the, on, at the beginning, um, if your model is as I suggested that it should be, that you, speaking is not your sole source of income, there are people who speak for free all the time and make you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars on the back end. So they've got courses to sell. They've got um, programs. They've got books. They've got you know, one-on-one coaching or mentoring or whatever. They've got other stuff. So they use the speaking solely as a marketing function. Um, if that's the case, it's okay. I don't think it's always the best idea because, you, like I said about the Rolex earlier, sometimes the fee telegraphs the value. So um, you have to really look at it. So if you're ever asked to speak for free, you have to think, okay, let's say they don't have a budget, they don't have money. You have to ask yourself, okay, why, would I do, like, why am I doing this? Um, and the money should never be the sole reason. So even if they pay you a zillion dollars, if the, if the zillion dollars is the only reason, you should still get at least one other thing out of it, right? Um, but let's say you know they don't have a budget and they're asking you to speak for free. Can you negotiate other stuff from them? Can you negotiate you know that they'll arrange with their publicist to get you some media interviews that's going to spread recognition recognition of you and build your brand? Can you negotiate? Um, that instead of being one of many speakers, that they're going to make you the keynote speaker of the event. Um, can you? And, and you know what? You may think that that's not likely or not probable, but I've actually done that before, where I was asked to be a speaker at a conference, and they didn't have, you know, my my usual fee. And I said, you know, bump me up to a keynote, and I'll do it. And and I've done it because the recognition is useful. Now usually when I'm a keynote, they do pay the fee, but, but that, that could be one reason. The, the thing you don't want to do, um, or if it's your ideal audience, if you can get in front of you know, 1,000 people who, and if you have the back end as I suggested, um, or even hundreds of people that are ideal prospects for your other business, whatever business you've built on the back of the speaking, uh, it may be worth it to you. But sometimes the, other, the thing is partially important to telegraph to your audience how valuable you are by charging a fee. It's also important to telegraph to yourself how valuable you are. And sometimes if you always speak for free and you don't get paid, um, you might undervalue uh, yourself. Now the other challenge that comes out of the question that you asked is um, – if you sometimes speak for free, how do you navigate that? And that is very, very, very challenging. You ask any speaker, um, because if you know one guy's paying you five thousand dollars to speak for forty-five minutes, and another guy's not paying you anything, 
or giving you a small honorarium, how do you handle that? Um, and that's a whole other big long discussion. But you just got to be really careful because if the guy is paying you $5,000, so I've turned down free things that, th there was a situation where exactly that happened. Somebody was paying me um, substantially to speak and then another branch of the same organization that would have been more valuable to me in terms of who was in the audience and future connections and future speaking um, asked me to speak for free at a networking event. If I hadn't had that large paid one so close in proximity time-wise, I would have probably accepted the free one because it was good for me. I had to say no to that at that time and said, you know, save me for a future thing because it would have just really made the person who was paying me feel like an idiot. Um, so it, it's a very, very good question that you asked there, and um, uh, you know, not not always the easiest to answer. Uh, here's another question about writing a book. So, what is your advice on? writing it, getting it done, getting it picked up, promoted, and especially in light of self-publishing. Okay, well, picked up and promoted seems to imply that um, whoever has asked this question is thinking you know, maybe of going with a publisher and that you know, you'll get, I don't know, Simon & Schuster or some big publisher to publish your book and they'll promote it. And, what, and, and the truth is if you speak to enough authors, whether they're self-published or uh, published with a conventional um, publishing house, the promotion is really up to the author anyway. Um, you know, unless you're one of the biggest names, unless you're a celebrity, unless you're, you know, known to be, you know, a really good draw and you command, you know, huge audiences, um, the the publishing houses only have so much to allocate to publicity, um, and they're not going to spend it on you know, somebody who's lesser known or has a smaller audience. In fact, Brendan Burchard, um, who has several successful, you know, New York Times bestselling books, one of the ways that he shared that he was able to get a contract with a, um, a big publishing house um, was by, you know, putting in a speaker proposal that said something like, I have an army of, I don't know if he said army of fans or army of followers or whatever, but he did. He had built exactly what I said to you today. Remember when I sent you guys to SpotlightSecrets.com? Um, and by the way, we haven't picked yet, so um, still go there if, you, if you're joining us late uh, and put in your name and email. Well, he built such a list by doing that and, and on Facebook and, and other social media that when he went to a publisher, it was not so much about even reading the book. They just knew that you know, if, he, if they published him, people were going to buy it, right? He, whether it's a good book or not a good book. And there are a lot of books that are on the New York Times bestseller list, not because they're great books, but because people buy them. And why do people buy them? Again, not necessarily because they're great books, but because they're a follower of this particular person. So that goes back to one of the mistakes that I shared with you um, about um, you know, not building a permission-based email list, not building a following. Uh, because that's going to help you um, get a publisher to take you seriously. I don't think you should actively spend too much time and energy pr um, pursuing a publisher. I think you know, with self-publishing right now, the books don't really look any different, especially if you get them printed in volume rather than um, you know, digitally. But even, even, even so, they don't really look that different. Um, you're going to be promoting it anyway, so you might as well have more control. You might as well own it. You might as well be able to control the cover. You might as well be able to control the back page where you give them a page where they can get you know, more information about you and bury some URLs in there, some domain names so that you can um, build your list from readers of the book. Um, you know, so, so whoever asked that question, go ahead and, and self-publish it if, if you like. And um, I do teach you a book creation workshop if anybody wants to find out more about that. Um, where we go over all the options, whether it's self-publishing or publishing conventionally, or there's some entrepreneurial um, publishing houses that are sort of a hybrid between the two. Um, you want to avoid like what are considered vanity presses, although that line has been obscured as well. But bottom line, you're going to be the one promoting it. So it doesn't matter. You do it yourself. They do it. Um, unless you're you know, uh, internationally known already, which probably most of us aren't, um, you're going to be the one promoting it. Right, that makes perfect sense. And I think also Seth Godin, when he talks and writes about publishing a book, he says, well, start, start with the readers, and then you can go into the topic and your actual thought leadership. So that's, that's very right. good advice. Here's another, uh, another question about uh, the fees. What's your impression when, not about free versus paid, but when it's a paid assignment or a paid, a paid opportunity, what is your impression about the, the differences between the fees in different parts of the U.S. or Canada 
let alone different parts of the world? Okay, that's a really good question. Now, I'm not the ultimate authority on speaking fees. I'll just tell you off the bat. But I, but I, I have spent a lot of time researching the concept of pricing and fees in general. So whether it applies to speaking or coaching or any service or even product. And in fact, I, I even created a, an audio CD called Provocative Pricing, uh, sorry, um, uh, the Power of Price, sorry, with Dan Kennedy. Um, pricing is elastic. It's something that people talk about, price elasticity. Um, I, have, I can't tell you how many clients I've had who've said to me, Sufi, you don't understand my business, or you don't understand my, you know, before they come to me, you don't understand the little small town where I work. Um, you don't, you know, um, uh, for example, the lawyer that I told you about earlier, right? When when he first came to me and I said we're going to raise your speaking fee, we, like, or not speaking your um, your lawyer fee, to almost double, and his retainer is almost ten times now. He said, no, it's a fee. You know, I'm a sole practitioner in a little small town, you know, outside a suburb, and you know that's what people charge around here. And I said, you know what, the, uh, pricing is elastic, so I wouldn't really pay so much attention to what they're paying in whatever small town you're in or whatever state you're in or even whatever country you're in. I would decide on a fee that you think that you feel comfortable with, that you think you're worth, and try to get it and see what happens. And if you do get it once or twice or three times, raise it a little bit and get a little bit more and a little bit more. And like, I'm not suggesting you jump from you know, $100 to $100,000 right off the bat. But if you're charging $100, you know, try next time 500. If you get that a few times, try 1000. If you get that a few times, try 3000 and then try 5 and then try more. And you'll be surprised. You might get 9 no's, but if the 10th one says yes, that becomes your new normal, right? And then you, you know, try to get that a few more times. What people are but you see something like speaking, it's not like a, you know, the kind of commodity like, you know what a pen cost, okay? Uh, you know, you can buy a pen for 50 cents or a dollar. But the truth is, you can buy a pen for a thousand dollars, right? So even maybe that's not the best example. It shows you how elastic something, even like you know, a cup of coffee, you can buy for a quarter or 50 cents if you bu- if you um, buy it and make it at home, or maybe a dollar if you buy it at your local donut shop, or maybe five dollars if you buy it at a place like Starbucks or a little cafe, or ten dollars if it's a little cafe in Lisbon where. Um, you know, uh, some of the people on the call are right now. Or, so, so what I'm saying is pricing is elastic. So I think the pricing really has a lot more to do with you and whether you're able to step into the spotlight and create some celebrity around yourself. Um, I wrote a whole 288-page book about how you do this. If you go to spotlightbook.com, um, you'll see the step into the spotlight book there. But it, it, it's how you create this idea that you're of value. And you see, remember one of the mistakes I said to you earlier was being an interchangeable commodity. If you're just another speaker on leadership, then if they have a thousand dollar budget, they're just going to or ten, whatever it is, they're just going to say, "Get me a speaker on leadership." But if you make a name for yourself, um, there's a guy in the U.S. called Larry Winget who is not an interchangeable commodity. Now the topics he speaks upon about are, you know, some of the normal topics about taking responsibility or whatever, but he does it in such a way. He's so um, he calls himself an irritational speaker, <laughs> you know, the pit bull of self-development, I think, or, or something like that. Like he, he's, he's irritating and he knows it and he's proud of it and he's not afraid of it. Um, he's not politically correct and people love him and they'll pay him for it. So it goes back to the mistakes that we were talking about. A lot of speakers don't create any reason for people to pay them more. So, so that's the answer to your question. There, there really is no limit. So Faith, I think it's terrific advice, and I think we have about uh, two minutes. Let me ask one question, which I believe would be of interest to a lot of uh, the listeners on this call. How do you actually find or nail down your niche and the, or the topic that you're going to talk about? What is, what is your method or advice for, for the folks on the call of finding that specific area where they can stand out? Okay, well, you know, it's funny. You say we have about two minutes left. Um, if you said we have about two months left, then I could give you a good answer to that question because that's about how long it takes to answer that question. But I'll just give you a few clues to start. Um, there are two ways of doing it. Either you start with the audience or you start with what you love. Um, if, if you start with an audience, you know that you serve 
uh, attorneys, okay, you can go to the the group of attorneys and say, you know, what's bugging you, what what's keeping you up at night, all the cliche stuff that you've heard from everybody else. Um, if you know you're passionate about something and you have one topic that really interests you, you can start with that topic. But if you don't find the intersection of those two topics, you're not going to go anywhere. So I would start with kind of a general topic. So so I gave you the example before. So this lawyer, um, he was just a litigation lawyer, right? Um, and that was enough for 30 years. Uh, not just litigation, litigation, wills, real estate, whatever. I said, no, we got to go narrower. So, so then he said, uh, okay, litigation. No, we got to go narrower. Then he said, estate litigation. I said, no, we got to go narrower. So after he said estate litigation, I said, okay, but whom do you want to serve? And then we came up with this idea of brothers and sisters fighting over their mother's cottage. And you know, he came up with this idea of the sibling fight. And after we came up with that, now all the newspapers are writing about him. He, he's regularly featured. He's being asked to speak much more than he ever was before. His fee is higher. So the answer to your question, Andres, is take whatever topic you think you're interested in right now and narrow both your – well, first I'll say either and then I'll say both. Narrow either your audience or your topic. Okay? So I don't talk, for example, my topic – you could just say that you know I'm a business speaker or a business coach, or you could say I'm a marketing speaker, or you could say you know you can keep getting narrower and narrower and narrower. But really, ultimately, what I speak about is how to stand out and get noticed. Um, and and then in terms of audience, I mean I don't speak to people who fix roofs. You know I speak to speakers, I speak to authors, I speak to entrepreneurs. So my audience is you know not the narrowest in the world, um, but if you know, there are other people who, who, for example, I have a client who's a financial advisor. So I was looking up one day about how to get narrower as a financial advisor. What would you speak about? Well, I found a financial advisor who only deals with millennials. You know, people who are um, just coming of age now. I found another one who only deals with people who um, are worried about their kids because they have some physical uh, challenges and they're worried after they pass away who's going to take care of their kids. I found other financial advisors who speak only about how you get your kids. Um, to get a scholarship for college when they don't qualify for financial need. I mean, you see how um, in terms of topics. So I guess the, 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 the thing to say to yourself is you choose something and then you say, how can I get narrower? And then you, you choose that and you say, how can I go narrower, both in terms of the audience and in terms of the topic. Terrific advice. Thank you so much. I think the only thing left for me, actually two things left for me. One is to pick the winners of uh, those who've downloaded uh, the file that you mentioned. And I asked uh, Steve, who's helping us in the back uh, with this, and he did a little uh, random, random selection method. So it's David uh, Eller and Monica and Anna Evans. I hope I'm pronouncing your names correctly. And, okay, so uh, what you, wait, sorry, can I interrupt you for one second, Andres? Please what do, the please three do, of, yes. What the three of you have to do, David and Monica and Anna, you have to send an email to info, I-N-F-O, I-N-F-O, at sufit.com. That's T-S-U-F-I-T.com. Maybe you can put up that slide, um, Andres, where it shows how to get in touch with us. Um, I know you have a slide with the info. It's, yeah, that's it. So you see on the left there the second thing? Um, info at sufit.com. If you send an email to there, um, and uh, so that way I'll have your email. Um, and tell me a little bit about you too. I want to know who you are, and I will send you the link to get the, um, the audio of the three of you. And by the way, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, guys, I've never done this. I don't think I've ever done it in all the years I've spoken, but because we have such a short time today, I'm going to do it for you, uh, Andres, and your people today. If you have a question that you didn't get an opportunity to have answered today, if you send an email to info at sufit.com, and in the subject line you put, you know, question, speaker hub, uh, and then your name and uh, my name, um, I will answer your question. Um, give me a few days because I have a lot of interviews coming up in the next week. Uh, also include your phone number in that email. So send an email to info at sufit.com with your question and uh, your phone number, and I will answer um, your questions. And that goes for the people in the replay as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sufit. Really, pleasure. really appreciate that. Fantastic advice, fantastic presentation. And uh, the number two thing that, thing that I need to share with the audience is the next session, which is going to be running on the 15th of November, talking about being well-known, well-paid, and wanted. So hopefully that's a good additional uh, approach to everything that Sufit has shared with us. 
And thank you so much for being here with us from all over the world. Truly appreciate that. And we'll be sending the recording in a few days, and then the transcript will be available online for your perusal within two weeks. So thanks again, and hopefully see you Thank you, you for having me, Andres. Thank you, Andres. Appreciate that.